Well, we were looking at differences between foods um, in the early days of the dietary fibre hypothesis. And we noticed that dietary fibre had uh, a, a, quite a marked effect, if it was certain types of fibre, in flattening the rise in glucose and insulin after meals. So we felt that it would be interesting to see whether fibre was the defining feature that determined uh, the effect of a food on postprandial, post-meal effects. And we found that it, it was only one of many. And it was one of many food form, uh, the nature of, of the starch and protein interactions, as well as the fibre and other things we couldn't determine, all of which influenced the effects of a carbohydrate um, on postprandial events, on post-meal events. So it, it was obviously not nearly as simple as we'd originally hoped that it would be. And because we didn't know what the reasons were, we then thought, well, we'd better start classifying foods because we cannot easily predict uh, what effect they're going to have on blood glucose. And if one's trying to design diets for people with diabetes, which is one of the things that we were doing, then obviously it became important to know what one was dealing with. It was interesting at that particular time also, um, the Bayer company came to us because they were developing ACABOs, which is an alpha glycoside hydrolase inhibitor. In other words, it inhibits the absorption of carbohydrate from the gut. And they were developing it because they saw a real therapeutic importance in this. And so we said, well, this is interesting. We're doing work on a drug and we're also doing work on foods. And what we're really talking about is slowing absorption of carbohydrate from the gut. And you could do it with a drug and you can do it with foods. We were able to show it was very effective with the drug. Um, and so we felt it would be very important to show that we can do the same sort of thing with foods and that these things were complementary. You could use the food and drugs. And in fact, we did a study with both fiber um, and with, with the drug Acabos and showed that both of them were complementary in reducing the postprandial uh, rise in blood glucose. So we could, we could create, if you like, our own low glycemic index diet uh, using drugs and food. And I think that's, that's been one of the things as we've been going forward. And we also noticed, as, as, as had, have others, Jenny Brown Miller and, uh, and others, that um, traditional foods tended to be low glycemic index. And so we, we wanted, if you like, to stop the disappearance from the diet of foods which would be otherwise slow in their, in their rise after a meal and, and would possibly be very good in preventing diabetes. These sort of things uh, have been later shown by uh, Walt Willett and his group um, uh, in the, the, the nurses' uh, study and other studies where they've, they've been able to show that there is a preventive um, approach to a low glycemic index diet, preventive in terms of not only diabetes but its closely related um, cousin cardiovascular disease. So important uh, public health implications of keeping um, slow release carbohydrates as we, we, we generically call them in the diet, slow release either, either by pharmacologic means or by various um, food and other means low glycemic index foods, low glycemic load um, foods, which is the concept that, that again, Walt has developed um, to describe foods or diets with a low glycemic index that have low carbohydrates of the high glycemic index sort. That's really why we, st I'm sorry, it's a long, long way round, but it's, a, it's the best I can do to tell you why, for many reasons, uh, we started looking at the glycemic index. We felt we had to classify things, basically, uh, so that we could use them in diabetic diets.